We live in a time of unprecedented challenges, a global pandemic, climate change, and growing needs in our cities. We won't solve the problems of tomorrow with the solutions of yesterday. It will take creativity. It will take a commitment to finding a better way. It will take new avenues of collaboration. In a word, it will take innovation. At the Shield Center for Innovation at Boston College High School, we're committed to creating the next generation of innovators. Students who are learning what it takes to create a better future, finding ways to serve those on the margins, and embracing change at every turn. Whether bringing innovators into our classrooms or leaving our campus to see innovation at work, our students are becoming innovators in Boston and beyond. Good afternoon. My name is Grace Cotter Regan, and I'm honored to serve as the president of Boston College High School. Boston College High School is a Jesuit Catholic school educating young men from grades 7 to 12, located in Dorchester, Mass. On behalf of the Boston College High School community and the Shield Center for Innovation, welcome to today's event. It's hard to believe it has been 18 months since we hosted our first event for the Shield Center for Innovation. That event, held in March 2021, had a simple title why innovation matters. Our speakers that day included the center's benefactor, Jack Shields, who spoke of the important role that innovation plays in solving challenges in Boston and beyond. This year, we've identified three areas of focus, public transportation, the housing crisis, and climate change. And through a series of programs, we will discuss how innovation is the key to finding the breakthroughs needed in each of those areas. Today, our focus will be on public transportation. Here at BC High, we have a special relationship with public transportation. The MBTA is our school bus with more than 75% of our boys riding the T each day and many of our faculty and staff. It's an education for our boys in, in an integral part to forming young men who understand and embrace the world around them. We welcome the seventh grade students from the Arupe Division at Boston College High School, led by Vice Principal for Arupe, Bob Hamlet, and the social studies teachers, Ms. Rother, Ms. Hauser, Mr. Hauser, and Ms. Piedad. Today is also the Center for Ignatian Identity and Formation Service Day for the seventh grade, so you'll see many of the boys around the point. I'm excited to share that we are joined by experts in public transportation. Steve Povtak, has been the general manager of the MBTA since January of 2019, having previously served as a director of the MassDOT board. His work with the MBTA has required him to constantly balance innovation with the challenges of running an aging system. In addition to his work at the T, this fall, he added another title to his already impressive resume, BC High Parent. We're happy to have him as part of the BC High community and honored to have him on our panel today. Our next panelist, Rich Davey, leads the New York Metropolitan Transit Authority, the largest transit, transit system in North America. He's previously held a number of positions in Massachusetts transportation, having worked from the tunnels of the Big Dig to the skies over Logan Airport. If you're wondering how he learned all, all to do all of this, let me tell you how it started. It started on our, our very own Morrissey Boulevard. Rich is a 1991 graduate of BC High and a member of our Board of Trustees. Our panelist, Sylvester Prakasam of the Singapore Transit Authority, had a scheduling conflict. The Singapore public transit system is a regularly ranked as top system in the world. Our panelists may be able to provide some reflections on the Singapore system. Moderating our panel today is Simone Rios, an award-winning reporter from WBUR. Simone has covered public transit extensively through his time at WBUR and is no stranger to our neighborhood here on Columbia Point, having worked for many years as a reporter at the Dorchester Reporter. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us today. Simone, take it away. Thank you so much, Grace, and thank you for inviting me to participate today. I'm excited about uh, what, what I'm going to hear. It's a unique opportunity, and I think the students are really lucky to have access to this. So I'll say fewer solutions to climate change are more clear than the need for robust public transit. But as with climate change, there are challenges facing transit uh, here in Boston, in New York and Singapore, of course. Um, today, we have two leaders in the field uh, to tackle these issues and talk about solutions. 
from right here in Boston and a stone's throw away in New York City. Um, I hope the two of you can share some thoughts about your unique experiences in, in these two cities. Um, I'll start with you, Steve, uh, being, being a local guy. Um, let's talk about innovation at the T. Um, and you can't have innovation without failure, without challenges. Um, so with everything that's been going on at the T in recent years, um, what is the greatest teaching moment during this time been? And what kind of changes have you uh, put into place as a result of that? Sure, it's a great, it, 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 great question. I think, you know, I think one of the, the challenges that we've all faced collectively has been the COVID pandemic. And, you know, one of our, I think one of our responses, and I think we've always tried to make sure our responses are centered on the needs of the riders. And I think one of the things we found was that riding patterns changed dramatically, particularly in the early days of the pandemic. So we did an awful lot of work shifting around service, taking service, particularly on the bus routes, and putting them on the bus routes where there was where ridership persisted, where there was durable ridership. In many cases, these were people who were transit dependent, and they had jobs where you had to you had to show up. You could not work remotely. We were able to shift service with them. That was kind of the macro frame around innovation. Kind of the micro frame I would put around innovation during this period would be we were able to capture some of the data that we were collecting that was just sort of used for kind of monthly ridership data, our team, our internal technology team was able to repurpose that data. And then we could push out to people in real time how crowded each bus was. So you could know the bus coming towards you. Was it crowded? Was it empty? And this is, you know, you think about particularly a moment in time in the mid 20 in mid 2020 and 2021, where people you know, really wanted to emphasize social distancing, we were able to provide that information to people. So I put that forward. Um, we've certainly faced plenty of challenges and I could fill the full hour talking about the challenges and our response to them. But I would put that forward as one of the major challenges that we've faced and responded to. Rich Davey, uh, it's, it's, thank you for, the, for coming here. I'm really interested to hear uh, the perspective of somebody who was in Boston and Massachusetts at the MBTA, um, then going to New York, a much bigger system. Um, talk about, first of all, talk about the differences. What were the, the biggest differences you saw coming from Massachusetts and going to New York? There are a lot less Red Sox fans in New York. I can tell you that. Um, I can imagine. So, um, I mean, as you said, the scale is 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 different, right? So, um, in New York, um, even you know, we're obviously coming out of the pandemic and have sixty percent, sixty five percent ridership uh, pre COVID. We're still carrying uh, five and a half million people a day. Uh, it's pretty daunting uh, to even think that your ridership before um, COVID was more like 8 million folks in New York. Um, and, you know, I think as Steve teased, uh, for many of our customers uh, in, 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 in New York City Transit, we are um, a lifeblood for them to get to a job, to school, to, you know, healthcare, um, whatever, you know, folks need to do around the city. Um, and, and so I think it's both daunting and it's also humbling. I was with a group of employees this morning. Um, I have breakfast with about a dozen employees uh, once a, a month. And we talked about the story um, from NASA in the 1960s, where you talk about a mission driven organization and someone asked the janitor at NASA, you know, what do you do? What's your job? And he said to put a man on the moon. And I think here in transit, what we talk about is it's everybody's responsibility, all almost 50,000 of us to move New York, uh, regardless of what we do. So I think for me, it's uh, it, it's, you know, the scale is larger, but it's still the same humbling experience of, you know, what we do is so critically important to move, uh, literally move this city. Were there any um, advantages to New York when you went there and you, you, you said to yourself, gee, I really uh, think that Boston could could do it this way. What can Boston learn from your experiences in New York? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've again not to go back to the sports. I've teased folks here to say I had the opportunity to 
manage a number of championship parades when I was at the T, and I'm looking forward to sports championships here in New York. We can we can leverage that uh, experience. But in seriousness, I think that um, you know there are things that we leverage off one another in the industry in in in, in the United States. So I know. I've been in touch with Steve in the last few months. Uh, I've only been on the job here now five months about some things that he and the team at the T are doing. Um, you know, one thing I'm really excited about, and this might not sound too exciting, but is predictive maintenance and really predicting when something will break down before it does, right? And so we have this new, talk about innovation, this new technology we're leveraging. Um, so artificial intelligence on top of our bus uh, telematics, right? Buses are really big computers now as opposed to just engines like they were 30 or 40 years ago. But we have this technology that we can actually predict uh, a bus's failure before it does and then pull it out of service. And then rather than having the check engine light on and needing to diagnose the issue for a few hours, the, the AI is so intelligent, it provides a um, maintenance plan to our uh, maintenance teams. So we're reducing our costs, we're improving our service, like, I think that's the kind of exciting stuff, you know, we're experimenting with. I know Steve and, you know, our other peers and other agencies across the U.S., we are sharing those best practices because, uh, look, we might be the biggest in New York, but we're not the smartest necessarily. We can learn from others. Yeah, and Steve, uh, talking about New York or, or talking about any transit system in the world, um, what are some of the things you see in other places that you think could, could really uh, you know, take off in Boston, but may not be as easy as you'd like to implement. I mean, I think the, you know, the big one for us is we are we are in the middle of upgrading our fare collection technology right now. Right now, the back office, essentially the guts of our fare collection technology is just not that flexible. So there's a lot of interesting policy ideas out in the public domain. We just signed a deal with uh, the city of Boston, Google, Sanofi, where they are gonna, they're gonna pick up the travel costs of their employees on the T and after the fact they're gonna pay, but we, we're limited in the amount of innovative things we can do. There's lots of ideas out there, fair capping, you, know, you, you pay on a per ride basis until you hit the cost of a monthly pass and then you're only charged for the pass. We can't do that right now, but the new fare system that we are in the process of installing, and I think New York might be a couple months ahead of us, or maybe more, uh, slightly more than that. I think once we have those technologies in place, we'll be able to do a lot more. We'll have a lot more flexibility on the back end to realize some of what I think are virtuous policy goals that we simply can't do from an infrastructure perspective right now. And Rich, what does it look like in New York? So is it similar to here in Boston where I go underground and go up to the machine and get my, my Charlie card? Do have a similar system or, or has it changed since I was last there? So it's changed, Simone. You, you can certainly do that and get a Metro card, uh, but um, increasingly uh, we have an open loop system. So if you have an Apple wallet on your iPhone or you know a debit or a credit card, you can use contactless payment now and just tap and go. And so about 40% of our subway customers are do using that uh, form of payment now and about 20% of our bus customers. So we're rolling that out. We just announced yesterday that if you qualify for a reduced fare card here in New York, either based on disability or age, you can now link your debit, credit card, or again, Apple Wallet, for example, other form of payment to get that reduced uh, card. But I think, you know, Steve's right. We're, we are you know, meeting our customers where they are. So for those who are, you know, have technology savvy, they can use that, but we will still have a system, we're calling it Omni, uh, one Metro New York, um, to be able to uh, to tap and go as well. We have unbanked customers, right? So folks who, you know, for, for usually for poverty reasons, don't have bank accounts necessarily or credit. And so we need to make sure that um, while we're making it convenient, you know, for, for all of our customers, we're meeting all of our customers where they are, which includes those who may be on bank. But Simone, next time in your Newark, in New York, I should say, don't get a Metro card, just uh, tap and go. That's great. And real quick, Steve, what's it going to look like, you know, in the near future? Will, will we have a similar setup? How will, how will ours be different here? Uh, ours, will, ours will be quite similar. It's the same it's the same manufacturer, so uh, our, ours will be quite similar. We'll have an open loop system, and it will be essentially bring bring the fair media you want to bring. If it's a if it's a wallet on a phone, 
if it's a credit card, there, there still there will still be a Charlie card. Uh, I know I'm speaking to an audience of M7 pass holders, so there will certainly be uh, there will certainly be passes uh, as well. Okay, so Boston and New York, um, almost almost sisters in a way, both with very long histories of your transportation systems, your your transit systems. Um, talk about moving forward, what, what are the, the, the leaps that we're going to see in the years ahead, in the decades ahead? You know, people talk about train systems in Asia and in different parts of Europe functioning, basically, it seems like at, at light speeds. Um, will we see these kind of changes? Will we see ourselves going more to a, a Singapore uh, or, or, you know, the types of uh, systems you see in Japan or in different parts of Europe? How long is that going to take? Is it going to happen, uh, Rich? Yeah, I mean, so I, I think it's it's a few places where you know collectively we need to focus to make that a reality. So in New York, we're still, for example, using signal technology from the 1930s and 40s, and I'm not exaggerating, right? So um, we have we are, and it's hard to be you know installing new signal systems on track that you're still trying to run, right? So we just can't close um, you know lines for for years to to in, it's so it's called communication based um, train um, signaling, if you will, and that's what we're very much focused on in New York. And so what does that mean? It means that trains can you know ride more closely together, but in a safe manner, if you will, as opposed to being spread out, having longer headways, and then having you know fewer trains, if you will. But that's sort of the math problem uh, that we're dealing with with an old signal system. And then to your point, it's you know finding you know better improvements. So you know our systems, both in Boston and New York, were built well before the Americans with Disabilities Act, right, was passed in 1990. And our systems, and Boston's done a much better job, but our systems still suffer from not being welcoming for all of our customers, right? And so um, we're very cognizant of that in New York, and it's incredibly hard to build in a built environment already, you know, escalators and elevators. And so that takes time. But that's, you know, I think some of the innovations and, and your point, like, you know, where we can where we can be competing, if you will, with some of the other best systems around the world um, are those signal technologies, but then also making sure that our system you know, is welcoming to all of our customers. And right now it's not. It almost seems like the more recent transit systems had have, have a real leg up being able to start from scratch using the most, you know, the, the state of the art technology of the day, whereas in Boston and in New York, you're dealing with infrastructure that can be a hundred years old or more. Um, Steve, same question to you. Uh, what kind of leaps of technology will we see? We've talked about some of them uh, but uh, bring us forward 10, 20 years, what's going to be different about the team? I mean, I think you're going to see, you know, we're, you're beginning to see newer vehicles, right? We've, uh, since the Orange Line surge, we've only run new vehicles on the Orange Line. And, you know, Rich touched on just how powerful that technology is. Um, you know, we're essentially leaping, if you think about vehicles, right, we're essentially leaping forward 30 to 40 years in terms of the technology in, available in the vehicles. And we, we actually have been using the, the newer vehicles as diagnostic tools. If we have a problem in a power section, we'll run one of the new trains back and forth over it. It will give us information about voltage, amps, the whole, you know, the a whole slew of data that we never had available to us. And what you're going to see over time is um, all the vehicles replaced on the red and orange line, and then the underlying signal systems replaced as well. And those two things have a will have a, a complementary effect. It's going to allow us to run more service. I think the challenge, which Rich, I think, adroitly pointed out, is how do you get it installed and continue to run the system? And I think we, we sort of called the question somewhat on the orange line with the month-long closure, which did allow us to do two stations worth of digital uh, digital signals. But there, as, as the, the more we can get these things in place, you're going to see much better, much more consistent service. The new vehicles have been performing just outstanding on the orange line. The mean miles between failure last month were 250,000 miles, which is one of our metrics for uh, service reliability. And that is that is off the charts relative to anything else in the MBTA system. So it, it, would it be safe to say then that the focus going forward is really about 
improving what we have as opposed to going to you know maglev some you know some completely some radically different system that the idea is is to to improve on what we have make it faster uh and and more reliable Look, Simone, I think so. We also, and I know Steve does too, in, in New York, we instituted when I started a monthly customer survey, right? So what are our customers saying? What do they want? And um, in New York, we're saying faster, cleaner, safer. Um, and sneak preview, we're announcing our strategic operating plan tomorrow in transit publicly, and it will be called that, faster, cleaner, safer, because that's what folks are asking for. And so... While maglev is an interesting technology, I had a chance to ride a maglev train when I was in Japan a few years ago. Um, you know, but not really inner city passenger rail, right? That's Boston, Washington, or, or to Chicago, if you will. Um, I think if you did a maglev train between Boston and Springfield, it would take you like 18 minutes to get you know between the two cities. Um, maybe that works, maybe it doesn't. But uh, but I think for our systems, it's it's. You know, I mean, Steve's running a system that opened in 1897. Uh, New York was a couple of years behind in 1904. Um, and, um, you know, r recognizing that reality that there are so many sort of improvements to be made around a system that, are, you know, systems that are 100 plus years old uh, is critical. I think some of the Asian cities you mentioned in particular have the, you know, have had the ability to build out you know, new systems today with today's technology, frankly, in some instances in environments where the governments, uh, let's just say, don't appreciate maybe environmental impacts as much as we're required to here in the United States or, you know, the kind of labor laws we have, right? So, um, you know, so, so there are definitely, there are definitely some systems where there are, I think, relevant learnings, but given uh, legislative and regulatory requirements, uh, not always relevant for what we're trying to do in the United States. Steve, you brought up the Orange Line shutdown. Um, uh, this took a lot of us by surprise. Uh, I think we learned two, two or three weeks before it was going to happen that the Orange Line, the entire line would be shut down for a whole month. That's an unprecedented step. I don't think it had ever happened. And you made the claim that uh, you were able to do five years of, of work that would have otherwise happened on nights and, and weekends in, in one month. Um, how did that go? Um, we're talking just, just to us here. So I'd love to hear, you know, <laughs> yeah, the thoughts that you the 400 people listening to this. Right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I think first, you know, first to just a little bit of explanation of kind of why it came upon us all so fast. Um, you know, we we knew we had a lot of work we wanted to do. Uh, the FDA had directed us to give uh, our, our track maintenance crews more access, and we felt like there was a body of work that needed to be done. And there was some of that work that you simply, you, you can't do it on nights and weekends in any form of efficient. You know, as, as you noted, some of the stuff would have taken five years. We wanted to get it done a lot faster, and we felt that was the right thing to do. Also, it's very difficult to rent ADA uh, compliant uh, third-party buses to actually run the bus shuttles and there was the window that the surge was in was the one window where we could get 200 buses we had every available ADA compliant bus east of the Mississippi so you know I know I know I rode shuttles from Florida and New Orleans and uh, so there was really a limited window of time and that's why it came upon us so quickly um, I would say in terms of the execution uh, the alternative transportation worked very well um, it was slow, but it was comfortable, I would say, in, in the buses. Also, lots of people diverted to the commuter rail. Uh, and also, the city of Boston did a nice job uh, diverting people. About 2,000 riders a day were on blue bikes uh, as well. So uh, nice job with the alternative transportation. We had teams across the entire line doing work, uh, which required a real choreography. There's only actually about five places that you can get onto the orange line with construction equipment and materials. So when you've got 13 priority projects and about 30 opportunity projects, you have to very carefully choreograph who's going where so that you can actually get stuff in. We got uh, we got a ton of work done. I think uh, I rode the Orange Line in this morning and I must say I, I showed up uh, 10 minutes early to the event I was planning to hit because I got in a lot faster than I expected. I'm coming from the south side. I know we still have some slow zones uh, that we're looking to remove uh, over the next month and two, two months. 
uh, on the north side, but we were able to get an awful lot done. Uh, we've also, as I noted before, we've also been running the new vehicles, uh, solely the new, new vehicles since the surge started. And I think that's a nice change for our customers uh, having those new vehicles. They're more reliable, they're cleaner, they're, they're much nicer. They're very nice they're, they're very quiet too. So much, much appreciated there. Rich, um, when you saw this announcement coming out of Boston that, that they were gonna be shutting down the Orange Line, what was your reaction to that? Did, did it strike you as, as the right move? And um, do you ever have to do that kind of thing in New York? Yeah, I mean, it, it, if safety is the top priority, which it is for Steve and the T, it's uh, it was absolutely the right move, and it took some guts. And but I would say, like, not unprecedented, and you know, it, it, precedent maybe in its scale. But when, when I served, you know, as transportation secretary in Massachusetts, we closed the government center T station for eighteen months um, to get that work done, and we had two choices: it was either going to take seven years if we left it open, or eighteen months. To me, the pain was a no-brainer, right? Uh, the second is we closed the Callahan Tunnel for 60 days and to repave it and improve it. And, you know, same, we got a lot of concern, uh, a lot of guff from folks, uh, but it would have taken two years to do with one lane. The traffic would have been, I'm definitely a rip the Band-Aid off kind of a person um, for sure. So I think it was the right call and took a lot of guts. Now in New York, uh, we have a bit of even a bigger challenge, which is we are a 24-7 operation. You know, the MBTA does shut down between 1 a.m. and 5 a.m. Uh, here, it's anathema uh, in New York, I can tell you, to, to even think about, uh, you know, shutting down the service to do construction work or for budget reasons, for that matter. So that's a bit of a challenge. But we tend to do a lot of our work on nights and weekends, which, you know, my observation the few months I've been here is, you know, it's inefficient. We're trying to make it more efficient. But this is why it takes, you know, several years to roll out those signal improvements I mentioned before, or some of the other things that we want to do. So it is a trade-off. Um, you know, it is a trade-off for sure. Um, you know, we do have the fortunate, uh, we are fortunate in New York in that we have, you know, multiple lines that intersect. We have express and local track, which the T really doesn't have anywhere. And so we can be more creative in how we shift service around. Um, but, um, but, you know, it, it's to me, we're looking for other opportunities to accelerate uh, work, as, as Steve mentioned. Some of the challenges here are, are, are different, though. Yeah, I remember Steve talking to me about the, the staging that goes into doing some of these projects that, you know, you get in, it takes several hours to set up and then you get like two hours of work done. And then you have to break everything down and, you know, get the train going again in, in an hour. Uh, it seems it seems crazy. Um, do you ever wish you had more flexibility in terms of shutting uh, either stations or or areas down? Would that allow you to get stuff done more effectively? Absolutely, absolutely. Our wrench time is another way to describe what you just mentioned. is is pretty pretty poor, right? I mean, usually in an eight hour shift for some of these jobs, uh, it might be four hours or less wrench time. So you know, to your point, you have to set up your flagging so you're safety because. You might still be working around active track if not on it, right? The third rail, um, obviously, don't touch it. Uh, you know, you will be killed, right? And instantly, uh, it is the environment in which the employees and contractors work under is very dangerous, and so safety for them first, and then to your point, bringing in equipment onto the tracks and then having to remove it to make sure that folks can get around safely. Um, you know, the whole environment. Now that said, um, I have challenged my team to when the construction team is doing large construction projects and taking over, uh, you know, maybe several uh, stations or territory to do track work, what can we do from a maintenance perspective that these stations are now closed? And so we, we actually just announced a program called Mop My Stop, um, which is more than just mopping stations. It's a big station refresh. So when we have the ability, because stations are closed for track work happening outside of the stations, you know, can we power wash? Can we paint? Can we, you know, do small track work in the facility, et cetera? And so um, we are, uh, that's been a very successful program. We've been doing that on, on weekends now um, as well. But to your point, Simone, it's like, you know, pushing, making sure safety first, absolutely, for our customers, our employees, and our contractors. And then seeing, okay, can we improve the wrench time uh, and be more efficient? But it is in an environment 
where you have so many dangers, it is it it, it is not easy. Yeah, and Steve, circling back one more time to you on that question, in hindsight, are you satisfied that, that the Orange Line shutdown was the right move? And if so, should it, will it happen again on other lines or some, something of a similar scale? Absolutely satisfied that it was the right move. Um, you know, I think we would have managed maybe the closeout a little differently and would have, you know, I think we could have been more effective in communicating that some of the slow zones were going to persist, but absolutely think it was the right move. Uh, that was reinforced for me this morning. My ride was much faster from uh, from from Forest Hills to State Street. So I'm, I'm, I'm pleased with that. I think uh, I think while we are we are going to use these types of shutdowns in in the future, they're going to be much uh, there. They will be more limited in nature. Uh, for instance, we've been shutting down both the Ash Ashmont branch and the Braintree branch periodically to get work done. One of the practical one of the practical gating functions here is just how many buses are available. It's it's well nigh impossible to shut down the entire red line and to bus it just because of the geography of where you're busing and the availability of buses. Uh, you would probably need you would probably need 350 to 400 buses, and I would you know I'd venture to guess that it would be extraordinarily slow uh, in doing it. It just it's just not practical. But we will be doing more limited diversions, and I think part of part of where we're evolving to is a strategy where these more prolonged long shutdowns allow us to be more efficient allow us to get more work done so we will be doing uh we will be doing more of that in the future yeah so changing gears a little bit i'll, I'll say that the two of you steve Poftak, rich davy you have the weight of the world on your shoulders particularly you steve uh as as i've seen over the last few months you, you've undercome a lot of a lot of fire from uh, a lot of different angles, and um, I don't envy um, that that responsibility. So um, I want to ask, uh, sort of on, uh, shifting to the question of climate change. Uh, when I say you have the weight of the world on your shoulders, that's that's what I was referring to, in large part, because everybody talks about public transit as as one of the top ways we can address climate change, um, but. Somewhat ironically, public transit is probably one of the biggest emitters of greenhouse gases. Hopefully that's changing. Um, but Rich, if you could talk about the, the environment in, in New York City, how much weight is being put on your agency to help with greenhouse gas emissions and, and what are you doing to address that? Yeah, I mean, Simone, it's it's an excellent question, particularly for the, for the boys listening to this. I mean, I. I think the, the issue of our time is climate change, right? It is. Um, it affects everyone on this earth. Um, we're seeing it play out in numerous and negative ways, and it seems like it's only going to get worse. Depending on where you live in the United States, transportation as an industry is one, it is the top or second largest contributor, to your point, to greenhouse gas emissions, right? On the flip side, however, public transportation can be, um, you know, the tip of the spear, if you will, to reduce that. And so, uh, you know, in Boston, I, I think the T continues to be the largest consumer of electricity of anybody in the state. I'm quite sure we in New York are, are, are the same. Uh, but um, at the same time, as I mentioned, you know, we, we moved five and a half million people in New York yesterday. Well, I'm sure about the same today. If you can imagine those folks in single occupancy vehicles around the city uh, the pollution would be extraordinary. What are we doing to green how we're doing? So, and Steve is doing this as well. A lot of other systems are, is really converting to electric buses, right? The technology is still a little nascent, um, but we are converting our entire bus fleet. We have about 6,000 buses here in New York to electric or alternative forms of energy. We have a plan out to do that by 2040. It sounds like a long time, but it's really complicated because the infrastructure required to power the vehicles um, needs to be built out in deep bus depots that are in some instances, you know, 50, 60, 70 years old. Um, there's also technology on hydrogen, uh, which is something we're watching closely. Again, it's still very, fairly nascent. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, New Yorkers do believe, you know, public transit, among other modes, walking, bicycling, you know, other 
um, forms of transportation uh, is the antidote to um, you know the antidote to to, to to climate change. And New Yorkers certainly, I think, embrace it. Uh, you know, Superstorm Sandy hit here ten years ago and dramatically impacted public transportation uh, in the city. So I think that um, you know there's an acute awareness here, at least. Uh, that we need to be focused on it. But I do think, you know, particularly for uh, boys who are 13 and 14 years old listening, climate change, in my opinion, as a, almost a 50-year-old guy, it is the existential crisis we will be facing and your generation will be facing for sure. And I guess we have to apologize for leaving it to you. I know Steve and I are trying not to, but, um, but it, it, it's a huge issue. It's a huge issue. Steve, how do you make the case uh, for public transit as a solution to climate change? You know, I, th I think we're a solution on multiple levels. One, to the extent that we can remove single occupancy vehicles and be an alternative, I think that's, you know, I think I, I think that's apparent. Um, as, I, as I hear tales of congestion and longer and longer commutes, I'm hopeful that people, you know, the, to the extent that we're able to provision reliable service for people, that they will see the T as, as an alternative um, and then I think, you know, I'll, I'll pick up on some of the themes that Rich already hit. Um, you know, we are transferring over over time uh, to, for instance, electrified buses. Right now we have a handful, we still have a handful of diesel buses. Most of the buses we have are diesel electric hybrids. Uh, we will be transitioning to all battery electric buses over the next 50, approximately 15 years. The secret there I would say is electric buses is relatively easy facilities that can accommodate these buses and building them while we're keeping the current bus system running is extraordinarily difficult. That's at least a four and a half billion dollar expenditure over time for the T. The other point, uh, the other point I'd, I'd, I'd note, Rich correctly said, we are the largest consumer of electricity in the state of Massachusetts and our consumption is entirely renewable. We, we purchase from renewable sources. So um, that is that is not not well known, but that is a commitment that we have made and honored uh, for approximately two years. And then I think the third leg of the stool for us then is uh, is what do we do with the commuter rail? Uh, commuter rail currently runs on diesel locomotives. Uh, we are mm -hmm. examining uh, a bunch of alternatives uh, that are electric. I think there again the, the the vehicles might be the easiest part. The toughest part is the infrastructure to serve them. We would e there's either going to have to be an evolution in technology that's going to allow us to run partially on battery power, partially on live electric power. But if you're only running on live electric power, you've got to run overhead catenary wire uh, across approximately 400 miles of, uh, of system, which is, which is a, just a, a monumental investment in infrastructure. Yeah, Aiden and Riley, two of the students I have here, asked why all trains aren't electric yet, if electric is, is the future, and what happens if and when they are electric? Perhaps, Rich, you could, you could address that one. Yeah, I mean, I think Steve said it. I mean, fundamentally, it's, it's a cost question, right? So to build out the catenary infrastructure uh, in, in Boston would, depending on who you believe, you know, a couple billion to maybe, you know, 10 billion, it's probably somewhere uh, on the higher side. So it's an extraordinary investment. Um, you know, again, nascent technology, but I believe um, at Deutsche Bahn in Germany, they're testing hydrogen fuel as a, as a renewable fuel for, uh, for trains, you know, again, very at its early stages, but that might be interesting and might avoid the kind of um, infrastructure build out that Steve mentioned. You know, here in, in New York, um, you know, our commuter rail system uh, is, it is electrified. Uh, that was built out um, as the system was built out over time. So, uh, you know, we don't have the kind of diesel trains that up to the T and others do in the United States. Um, so we're, we're, we're fortunate in that regard. But I think that next um, code to crack is, is our, you know, our buses. And uh, in particular, you know, if you actually looked at where some of our bus facilities are located, I know in Boston it was the same, you know, these are in environmental justice communities, typically communities of color, lower income communities that have been, you know, uh, negatively impacted and disproportionately impacted based on transportation decisions in the past. And that's something else we're grappling with, I think, as an industry um, to say truthfully, you know, this has been um, 
you know, this has been an industry that has uh, had negative impacts on, on, on communities, and, and we need to do our best to address that. Electrification, of course, is one of the ways to do that. Great. Um, well, thank you so much for, for that. I want to ask you about your own career paths. Rich, you're a BC High guy. Steve, you're a BC High dad. Um, we'll switch to you, Steve. Uh, did you always envision a, a future in, in transit? How did you get to this point where you're running the MBTA? I uh, no, this I, I wish I could tell you this is the product of a careful, meticulously planned uh, career trajectory. I, you know, I ended up working. Uh, I ended up working in the state house in the executive office of administration and finance uh, with oversight of the capital budget. Huge part of the capital budget is transportation. Really, re I loved that work. It became a passion of mine. Uh, I ended up kind of out in the think tank research institute community for a number of years, had the opportunity to serve on both the MassDOT board and the MBTA fiscal and management control board for a while. Um, just the opportunity to be interim general manager came along in 2017. I, I highly recommend it before you take the job full time. If you can, if you can work 10 weeks as the interim general manager, at least pre pre prepares you somewhat for it. And then I was sort of in the right place at the right time at the end of 2018, where the T was going through another transition and, and ended up here. So um, I think, you know, part of it was just following something that I was passionate about and engaging in the work uh, as opposed to, you know, I think it's, it's easy sometimes to sit and opine behind the keyboard or on social media, actually engaging in the work, joining boards, joining av advocacy groups, uh, becoming, becoming engaged, I think is important. And, you know, in some cases, uh, the opportunities will present themselves. So that's my, uh, that, that's my, my story, somewhat haphazard in how I got here, but obviously, uh, it's an honor and a privilege to have a position like this. Yeah. And, and Rich, um, you came from, from Boston to, to New York. Talk about your path from BC High, uh, which might inspire some of the some of the students on. And why did you leave Boston? Yeah, so I grew up in Randolph. Uh, you know, took uh, the red line to the 240 bus uh, on most days and walked down. You know, my street. Um, my parents still live in the house I grew up in in Randolph. Um, went to Holy Cross and then went to Gonzaga. I did Jesuit Volunteer Corps for a year and went to Gonzaga for law school. So you can hear that the Jesuits have played a an important part of my development uh, as now a man. And, um, you know, Man for Others uh, certainly continues to resonate uh, with me. So I graduated from law school and I worked here in New York for three years doing some stuff in a private firm. And I was here during 9-11 and, and kind of had a 9-11 moment and said, you know, the private firm I was working at, it's not what I wanted to do with my life. And so I quit, moved back to Massachusetts in 2002. and. Uh, ended up getting into transportation uh, through law, um, and you know, 20 years later, um, you know, I've done a lot um, with public service. When I left government service uh, in 2014, um, I did five years in the private sector uh, and lived in Boston. I, my wife and I still have our home, um, in, you know, in Boston. We have an apartment here in New York. That's where I spend most of my time now. But. Um, but I had this, you know, the, 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 my boss uh, called about this job and said, would you be interested? And um, I had one more of these in me, which was to say one more, you know, big public service, let's roll up our sleeves and see if we can do something good. So, um, you know, as Steve said, I, I continue to be humbled and honored by the ability to do these things and have the trust of, of people and, and have a great team. Um, I often say I'm a figurehead and, you know, there's a lot of other people who run the place. Um, but uh, but it, it goes back to, for me, for, to BC ISMA, which is, you know, being challenged uh, uh, as someone with, uh, you know, a middle class background, but still being privileged and being challenged to, to give back. So it's hard to say no when you've got opportunities like this. It seems like Boston is sort of the training ground for, for big positions and in New York City, we've seen it in, in the police department and in transportation and other fields, I'm, I'm sure. Um, we have a question here from, from an alum uh, who says, it's an interesting question that actually has been raised 
by by public officials in Massachusetts in recent recent days, actually. Um, how do you balance uh, expanding service, you know, new stations, new lines, whatever that might mean, extending to new areas, um, while also maintaining systems that are over a century old? And I think that this is one of the criticisms that has come at the T, that there's been perhaps too much emphasis on expansion and new things and not enough on maintaining uh, the existing infrastructure. Steve, uh, how do you balance those two things? I, I think that is one of the challenges of this job, and I don't think we've—I don't think we have always risen to that challenge. I think there is always inevitable, I would say, public, uh, public and political pressure to do new things because that's exciting and it's it's the opportunity. Whereas, you know, I say no one, you know, no one cuts a ribbon for a preventive maintenance project, right? No one when you replace. 500 feet of track, there's no public event, there's no pictures. And I think it's part of our work, both myself and Rich, to make sure that the balance is right. What we've done is increase the amount of capital spending. The capital budget this year is 2.5 billion at the T. Um, our goal is to spend 2 billion of that, we think is realistic. Uh, only a couple hundred million of that is going to expansion. All the rest is to either repair or modernize the existing system. So I think we have the balance right from a budget perspective. We have also worked to ring fence each one. We have two expansion projects underway right now, the Green Line extension and South Coast Rail down to Fall River and New Bedford are the two, uh, the two expansion projects at the T. They are built as essentially separate management teams so that they, none, of the, none of the preventive maintenance work, none of that is wrapped up in working on these projects. They have a separate management structure and a separate set of resources. So that's one way we've tried to keep the focus of the organization. But I, I think it is a recurring challenge because um, you know, we've seen what the we've seen what decades of underinvestment looks like, right? The the core system is not where it should be uh, in terms of in terms of reliability and asset quality, and I think that's one of our challenges that you know Rich took on when he was here, and that we we continue to take on. Yeah, Rich, I'm sure you face the same challenge. It, it, is our capital investments happening? Um, by the same people who are involved in, in maintaining existing infrastructure, or is it is it separate, like Steve was saying at the T? Yeah, it's now separate here at, at Transit, which I think you know, as folks ask me, you know, what's a learning? I think that does make sense, where you can sort of you know have folks, set, but make sure they're working together, right? Because that capital team is going to be handing the operations team a thing, whatever that thing is, to run. So sometimes it that can get lost, but making sure that that um, coordination is there, I, I think carving the two out are important. But I, I look, I'll say it even pl more plainly than Steve, because he's still in office in Massachusetts. I am no longer. I would often have folks when I was secretary say to me, well, you know, Mr. Secretary, we've been waiting for this project in, you know, X city in Massachusetts for the last 20 years. It's our turn. And I would say, well, is it relevant today? Well, that's irrelevant. Like it's our turn. We, we you know, we deserve this thing, this project. And mm -hmm. I, like, I think it's hard for elected officials and others to hear the words no, or you know, maybe there's a better way to do what you're trying to get to. Maybe a bike lane is better than a bus lane, or better than a new light rail service. And and, and I think there's a reluctance in some instances to hear that uh, that that question, um, you know, there are still as you know, Steve is working on some very large projects, the Green Line extension and South Coast Rail. But I, I know there are, you know, 10 other large projects uh, that people are probably knocking at his door to build and, you know, asking whether those are relevant today can be uh, can be hard. Um, and as he also said, I think this is endemic across this industry is it's, uh, you know, it doesn't get um, the kind of notoriety when you build a new substation or build a new track, but expansion is something that uh, politicians like. There's also a funding question, I think at the federal level too, where, although that's been changing, but I think there's been a bias toward funding new things um, from the federal government, which funds a lot of what we all do in transit, as opposed to maintenance. And again, that's changing a bit, but I think again, uh, politics, uh, you know, would push people toward the new shiny objects, a new station, a new car, a new line, again, some of which is necessary, but sometimes to the detriment 
of the work that needs to go on, which is, you know, up improving the signal systems that are from the 1930s or 40s. Yeah, well, I can see why those two things are, are fundamentally important. I lived in New Bedford before I came to BUR seven years ago, and everything was South Coast Rail, South Coast Rail. So it's good to see that there's been real progress. That's decades in the making. Uh, and they, they need it down there in, in terms of economic development. Um, you know, nothing nothing more important than, than South Coast Rail. But it's equally important to, to keep people safe and, uh, and moving along in, in Boston. Um, another question we have from, from uh, BC High alum and a, a New York City resident uh, who asks why it's so expensive to build transit in the US compared to other developed nations like Spain. I don't know how much cheaper it is in Spain, but that's that's the perception here. Yeah, I, I'm happy to weigh in. I mean, I think there's both some myth and then reality, right? So, um, um, you know, on the myth, if you look at other me mega projects uh, like the Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth the Elizabeth line, Elizabethan line, in, 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 or the Jubilee line in, in London, Crossrail, all um, massive, um, you know, massive projects that cost uh, well above what they were budgeted for. I think there are other examples in Europe and other places. So it's not as if I, Matt, you, you, the U.S. has a market on things that might be over budget. Uh, all that said, though, I mean, I think New York in particular, I studied the Bay Area market before I joined um, MTA. Uh, look, there, I think there are a few reasons, insurance costs, the high cost of uh, wages, uh, the cost of living, right? So for the folks that you're, um, uh, the services that you're procuring in New York, it's a market competition. Uh, building in this city is incredibly complicated under the city for a bunch of reasons. Um, um, and then, you know, look, I mean, in, in large cities in the United States, they tend to be, you know, unionized labor towns. And, and that's not uh, casting aspersions at all. I grew up in a household where my, my dad was a, was a union carpenter. Uh, but the, um, you know, but that can potentially drive up costs as well. Oh, this is the flip side, you know, I think folks would argue is you might get a better product as well. So, and then lastly, I think the regulatory regime is, is another question. Um, you know, the, the regulatory regime in the U.S. tends to be more rigorous around environmental impact, for example. And then Steve will know this. And then lastly, there's the mitigation, which usually there's a line of folks uh, who say, you know, this project is negatively impacting me and you need to build this out of the other thing that are unrelated to the project. Um, and, you know, that can change designs, that can change cost structure. So there's a lot of stakeholders as well that need to be, um, you know, addressed in these projects. So I think those are at least some of my reflections on both experiencing it, you know, in Boston and the Bay Area and then observing it here. Since I don't have uh, the capital program under me at, at, at Transit, I'm not very close to it, but I do observe it. And those are a few things I've seen. Yeah. Um, Steve Poftak, we have a, a question on BC High. So given the school's reliance on the T, um, and, and particularly the JFK UMass stop, um, that station has had challenges and tragedies uh, in recent years. Can you talk about what's in store for, for that station, JFK UMass? Yeah, we're, we are, um, I'd say we're, at, you know, we're active participants in the conversation about the whole area. Um, there is a planning study underway uh, related to Cuscusco Circle. And I think the, the, the redevelopment of JFK UMass is going to be, is going to be part of that. I think we are eager to partner with uh, the significant amount of development that's going on there. I think we all acknowledge that station needs to be rebuilt. Um, I think the whole area needs to be replanned, uh, and I look, for, you know, I look forward to participating in that, uh, both as the general manager of the T, but also as a uh, as as a parent of a BC High student uh, to ensure that that um, you know that 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 gets done in a, a thoughtful way that takes takes into account um, all the needs of the stakeholders. A rebuild of the station is not currently in the capital plan but we are looking to advance at least design money in, in concert with the broader planning that's gonna go on for that entire area. Um, thank you for that, Steve. We have another question here uh, saying that when I think about the MBTA and, and the New York system, I think about trains. Will future 
innovation be improvements to trains or something entirely new? We touched on this a bit, but is that what we'll see 50, 100 years from now? Are we going to see the trains as we know them today or some radically new different technology? Rich. Well, I think both. Um, I think, you know, for cities like Boston and New York that have been built around, you know, an existing transit network, uh, there's still going to be significant value uh, to running to running trains and tra- running train service, right? There's no doubt. Um, but look, we're both uh, cities that have rich waterfronts, um, and you know, Steve runs a ferry system that I think is tends to be the most popular uh, uh, service that he runs. At least it was when I was there. Um, you know, we have a ferry service here in New York. We don't run it; the city does. But you know, finding other ways uh, to get folks around. And look, micro mobility, you know, so whether it's e-bikes or e-scooters are clearly happening and have to be accommodated. You know, you could have a whole other innovation session on um, advanced air mobility, you know, drone technology and whether that's, you know, commercial delivery of packages or actually moving people around the city. You know, I do worry a little bit that uh, it becomes Jetsons like meaning, you know, those who are uh, of means are flying around those of us who, who you know we're not and like a, a, some kind of a multi-class society around transportation i do worry a little bit about that but you got to get the technology first but i assume it's it you know simone it's going to be all of the above the built system and trains are going to continue to be a very efficient way to move people around cities like boston and new york uh, but then continue to leverage um new technologies but also old i i, I think you know ferry s- service for example in both cities is probably you know, a hidden gem that could be expanded in a meaningful way. And Steve, this is my last question here, but what is your moonshot for the T long after you're gone? What, what, what do you see happening? What does the T of the future look like? You know, I think I, a T of the future that operates, uh, that operates more efficiently and more reliably, and that means uh, new cars on the red and orange line operating at much tighter headways, so that I mean, one of the commit, you know, one of the our goals is to be at eventually every three minutes on on the red line, uh, and we've purchased enough cars to do that. We just have to get the signal system in place. It's a bus system that's substantially expanded and has infrastructure in place to operate a lot more efficiently and a lot more high frequency lines. And I think you know, there's still a lot to be written on both commuter rail and ferry as well. So. Uh, some level of innovation, but also more service, more reliable service. Thank you so much um, to all the students for for paying close attention here uh, and and to Rich Davey and Steve Poftak from uh, New York City and Boston. It's been really interesting having you here today. Um, I want to go back to Grace Carter Regan, uh, the president of BC High. Thank you so much, Simone, and thank you to our panelists, Rich and Steve and Simone, for making the time for the Shields Innovation Series here at BC High. I know I learned so much. I'm sure the boys have learned even more. Uh, Thank you, gentlemen, for providing an incredible dialogue on the challenges we face locally, nationally, and globally around transportation, capital planning, safety, access, and infrastructure. We're grateful for your leadership in public service, and I'm certain our seventh grade students and the high school students involved with the Shield Center on the Zoom call will make this a priority to continue the conversation in their classes as leaders of the future. I was really struck by Rich's comment on AI and the bus telematics tracking locations on buses, and probably a new field for our boys to consider. BC High looks forward to being a part of the planning, Steve, on Columbia Point with our group Point Partners, which encompasses all of the leaders on the point. So we'll be right there with you in the planning. And I also want to thank Jack Shields for his vision, generosity, and commitment to our students at BC High. We thank the Innovation Council chaired by Peter Dolan, our friends at Virtual for always making this such a flawless event, and our BC High team, Director of the Shield Center, Joe McNamara, Principal Lewis, and our leaders who work to support the Shield Center programming, Kelly DiGregorio, Colleen Carter and Ashley Gonzalez. We hope that you will join us for our next Shield Center event on February 16th to discuss the important challenges with homelessness and homeless crisis here in Boston and beyond. So on behalf of the Shield Center, thank you to everyone on the call. Thank you boys and teachers and staff for participating. And we hope you have a great day, BC High.